welcome everyone to this very um, scintillating and uh, intellectually thought-provoking lecture by Professor Scott Lucas today at the Center for India West Asia Dialogue. As you all know, my name is Dr. Shubda Chaudhary and I'm the editor of CWOD. Um, today we are going to talk about Iran, Israel and West Asia, the indirect war and the uh, ramifications of it. A uh, few house rules are, please keep your mic on silent. If you have any comment when Professor Scott is speaking, so you can just, uh, uh, you know, write it in the comment box. Um, along with it, uh, uh, when in the end you ask where your question answers, you please introduce yourself, where you're from, what's your name, and uh, switch on your video if possible. And let us all maintain a very healthy decorum of uh, uh, the, you know, the entire political hygiene of asking and maneuvering through questions and answers. Um, so we are also joined today by Dr. Omar Anas, who is the research director of CBOARD. And uh, just a little bit brief about the think tank that we uh, focus primarily on India's perspective in West Asia, the foreign policy, the socio-cultural, economic, political domains of it. And we every month organize lectures um, regarding whatever is at that point uh, topical on that uh, region itself. So with this, I would give the introduction of Professor Scott. Uh, Professor Scott Lucas is Professor of International Politics at Clinton Institute University College, Dublin. He is Professor Emeritus of International Politics at the University of Birmingham also, and founder and editor-in-chief of EA Worldview. You should definitely follow the website and its Twitter updates. They are very, very in line every day with um, whatever is happening internationally. Uh, it is a leading site for coverage of international affairs. Professor Scott Lucas is a specialist in US and British foreign policy and international relations. He began his career as a journalist in United States and wrote for many UK uh, leading newspapers of United Kingdom and magazines before he founded EA Worldview in 2008. He is also a po political analyst for international radio and television channels, including BBC, Canada's CBC, Ireland's RTE, France 24, Dershwell, Al Jazeera English and Arabic, Poland's TVP World, China CGTN, Pakistan's PTV World and other outlets throughout India. You'll see him through various media outlets in India also giving his views. So thank you so much, Professor Scott Lucas, for uh, being present here today. And now I hand over the mic to you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's always such a pleasure to join you folks. Uh, I mean, I, I like your academic research, I like your engagement, but what I always like is the fact you've got dialogue in that title. And I think dialogue is so important in the world that we're in today, uh, including the topic that we're talking about, uh, which is Israel, Iran, and the indirect war. And so thanks for all of you who are coming in uh, to join in it, not a lecture. I'm gonna give you some thoughts and then I'm interested in your thoughts as well. So please do use the comment box. Uh, at the very top of the comment box, there's just some guideposts for what I'm going to talk about. But in case you can't see them, I will refer to really the five general areas that I want to talk about. Uh, but first of all, the, the reason for the title um, is that uh, in working as a journalist, working for EA Worldview and working for other outlets, um, I've been involved pretty much on a daily basis well before October 7th, the date of Hamas's attack on Israel. Um, been involved for many years in terms of covering what's happening in the Middle East. Um, and that includes not only Israel, Iran, but other countries such as Syria um, and the Assad regime's deadly, deadly suppression of the protests there. What's happening in Iraq, of course, in the aftermath of the 2003 invasion uh, with consequences that still continue. Um, and in addition to covering these things on a day-to-day -day basis, I have a background where I had done work both at universities in Iran and universities in Lebanon. Um, so, you know, I had, had been involved with and, and have, you know, colleagues in Israel. I've got colleagues also in the Palestinian territories as well. So for me, this notion of an indirect war predates October the 7th. And I know that we had the headlines for obvious reasons in the last 10 days because of 
the possibility of direct war. But it's always a reminder that whatever happens with that, and I will talk about that, is that this indirect war is set to continue. And by that, what I mean is it's not only the economic competition between powers here, it's not only the political competition and geopolitical competition between the powers here, it's not only the ideological uh, competition here, including religion between the, the leaderships of Israel and Iran. Uh, it is actually an indirect war in terms of tactics to damage the other side, to harm their personnel, to harm their capabilities. And in particular, for many years, that has taken the form of Israeli attacks on Iranian interest in Syria, something I'll talk about a little bit more within the, 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 the presentation itself. But the, the Israeli attacks on Iran inside Syria date from around 2013. So that's been going on for more than a decade. What happened is, is that there was a moment, and we're in that moment right now, where that indirect war gave rise to direct confrontation, but it was very much managed confrontation. Both the Iranian attacks and the Israeli response in the last 10 days were demonstration attacks. They were not designed to cause widespread damage. They certainly were not designed to kill civilians or even to inflict that much damage on military targets. They were more demonstrations of power or demonstrations of supposed strength to cover up weakness. That's something I'll explain. So to be a spoiler for what I'm talking about today, before what happened, before Iran's attack on Israel, as large as it was, my analysis was, and not you know, certainty, but my analysis was it would be a limited attack in terms of trying to cause damage. And certainly just before the Israeli response, while a lot of people were talking about Israel trying to cause widespread damage in Iran, I thought that was highly unlikely. So I was not surprised at the very small scale of the Israeli response. So I don't think the direct confrontation is one that, whether we're in India, in Turkey, where I am in Ireland, that, that we're looking at, I think what we're looking at is more that the indirect war will continue, especially as long as Israel is continuing its open-ended war in Gaza. That indirect war will continue, and there's always a possibility, not with the intention, but a possibility that indirect war will escalate into direct confrontation. So I need to walk through how I get to that. And I think the first thing, if I could do is area one, if I could step back and talk about the context for the Israeli-Iran relationship. And I'm going to talk about several aspects of this. Certainly, I would start off with... Um, you know, the ideological and the religious aspect going back to the formation of the Islamic Republic in 1979. And you all will know this from day-to-day -day rhetoric, and that is that the Islamic Republic being effectively a theocracy, um, so not just a country which is premised on the observance of Islam, um, but one in which the Islamic rulers, notably the Supreme Leader, have control is one in which Islam or the Islamic Republic poses itself as an opponent of uh, what it would call Zionism. And that is a combination of uh, the Jewish ideology, Jewish religion, but also Jewish ideology, specifically a Zionist ideology. And that, of course, at its most heated is the Islamic Republic declaration by some in the Islamic Republic uh, in the past and the present uh, that Israel should not exist, or that to give the colloquial phrase, although it's disputed whether it was ever framed this way, Israel should be wiped off the map. Conversely, uh, Israel, of course, has no diplomatic relations. Uh, sorry, uh, ideologically, the Israeli leadership is ideologically opposed to uh, a leadership of Iran, which happens to be Islamic, but not primarily on ideological or religious grounds, but they would argue on the grounds of security. So let's make that the second area. Ideology and religion leads to the security aspects. And the security aspects are very much 
that Israel perceives itself as, uh, or the Israeli leaders perceive themselves as being threatened on a daily day basis by Iranian capabilities. Now, it may not be that Iran has the actual capabilities to wipe Israel off the map, but Israeli leaders will always present that threat that's there, of course, especially through the possibility of an Iranian nuclear program. Uh, Iranian leaders will position themselves in saying, uh, our security is threatened not only by Israel, but it's threatened by those who are allied with Israel, the West, and especially the United States. So ideology and religion linked to security would make us position itself that we would have a position of ongoing confrontation. And certainly, third aspect, if you talk about the domestic aspect of this, the domestic presentation of the leaderships, not of everyone in the country, not everyone in Iran believes that Israel uh, should go unrecognized. Not everyone in Israel believes that the Islamic Republic should be treated as an enemy. But at least of the leaderships, the domestic presentation is, you must support us against this enemy that is beyond our borders. And again, this is not something that is just from October the 7th. This goes back all the way uh, what is now going back 45 years, is that the original um, supreme leader of Iran, the founder of the Islamic Republic, Ayatollah Khomeini, would have presented Israel as an existential threat to Iran, to the Islamic Republic and its mission. Uh, most Israeli leaders, most Israeli leaders have posed Iran as an existential threat. Not all of them, but most of them. Certainly Mr. Netanyahu has done so, the current prime minister. At times when there is escalated tension, both leaderships will play to their domestic populations in saying, we are strong, we will protect you against this enemy. They will never acknowledge weakness in the face of that enemy. To do so, they believe would lose support. So once again, we have a factor that points to confrontation. The fourth factor, the geopolitical confrontation generally, geopolitical situation generally reinforces that. Because geopolitically, if you are the Islamic Republic and you have framed this as being not only an Israeli enemy, but a enemy in the West, then geopolitically you have set up, let's adopt the phrase that Samuel Huntington used, I hate the phrase, I think it's awful, I think it's useless as an academic concept, but it's a very useful propaganda concept, which is the clash of civilizations. So that geopolitically, when you consider the Middle East and the global situation, this is a confrontation. And Israel will do the same thing. Israel will say that we are not only facing the question of Iran, but we're facing the question of Iran, which is seeking allies who also might wish to harm us, might wish to destroy us. That, however, and we've gone through four areas, ideology, religion, and religion, um, the question of security, the domestic concept, and then geopolitical concept. You think, oh, okay, we're in a never-ending conflict. The fifth area, however, is the regional conflict. And this is where it gets complicated because it is not always the case that the regional situation is one that leads to confrontation between Israel and Iran. Perhaps the most famous example is that in the 1980s, and a lot of you may know this, but just to, re to, to reinforce this, is that Israeli entities, uh, not the uh, governor, oh, sorry, not the government per se, but entities who were working on behalf of the government actually supported or provided or liaised with Iran against Saddam Hussein in Iraq during the Iran-Iraq War of the 1980s. Uh, you all might know of, of the scandal that developed in the 1980s where the United States also was uh, offering to provide military weaponry to Iran, uh, the Iran-Contra scandal. Israel was involved in it. Israel was providing military equipment to Iran or seeking to do so. And certainly the Iranian leadership, the Islamic Republic's leadership, sort of modified in practice its relationship with Israel, even though it didn't recognize Israel, because of the possibility of that assistance. In the 1990s, the government under Hashem Rafinjani, the president, 
and then the reformist government of President Hatami were not as hostile to Israel. Their, their policy adjusted and it shifted. It was only really with the change in dynamics with Ahmadinejad's election in 2005 and then his disputed re-election in 2009 that the regional situation and Iran's domestic situation position themselves both in the standpoint of confrontation with the Israelis. Is that okay so far, folks? I mean, that's okay. So that's that's sort of a context. And, and we there are other contexts we could bring in. We could bring in economic and cultural context, but I'll stick with those for the moment. Area two, the 21st century background. What is interesting is that, as I just mentioned, if you when you entered the 21st century, it was not necessarily the case that Israel and Iran would be in this perpetual confrontation. Once again, you'll remember that as we get into the 21st century, the focal point of the region, although Iran-Palestine is always there, is always an issue, the focal point, of course, had become Iraq again because of the buildup towards the 2003 invasion. And once again, uh, both Israel and Iran, they might have, uh, well, they had, they certainly had questions about how the invasion was conducted but they didn't shed any tears about the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iran. But of course, when Saddam Hussein falls in Iran, that opens up the question of where the region is going to go next. And of course, what happens is we get just simply a complete kaleidoscope of turmoil and disaster. You start with Iraq, you start with the insurgency and then the civil war, that has knock-on effects because Iran will see its security being threatened by what happens in Iraq with what it would see as a U.S. occupation. Iran's nuclear program was revealed in 2003. That means that Israel, again, could justify saying we have an existential threat to our security through the prospect of Iran nuclear weapons. In 2003, an approach by the Iranian government to the Americans to discuss these issues unwisely was rejected by the Bush administration. And there were actors in the Bush administration who quite famously said, all right, you start with Iraq, you make a left turn and you go to Iran. Now, that was not the prevailing view of the Bush administration, but it was one in which enough people believed that, that it held out against a reconciliation with Iran. And what happens is that Iran, under the Quds Force, which is its main force outside of Iran, begins to embark on a regional policy trying to gather influence, trying to, to develop its own clients, as it were, in Iraq and in other countries, such as Syria, such as Lebanon. That is occurring at the same time that we have the big turn, at least one of the recent turns in the Israel-Palestine relationship, which is that having withdrawn from Gaza in 2005, the Israelis not only crack down on the West Bank, but after Hamas takes power through elections in Gaza, Israel turns to a position of hostility and introduces the blockade on Gaza. There is also the 2006 Israeli war with Hezbollah which is relatively short, but it highlights the fact that you could always have that confrontation between Israel and a group which is allied with Iran. And all of those developments in the first years after the Iraq war are then magnified and they are repositioned because the kaleidoscope turns with the so-called Arab Spring. What the Arab Spring brought in, of course, was the initial hope that you would get reform, that you would get rights, you would get justice. But as that unraveled in certain countries, then it would affect both Israel and Iran. And perhaps the leading case of this, Lebanon is a case we could talk about to an extent. And Lebanon is in serious trouble right now, for those of you who haven't been following it. And it's the possibility that the almost complete collapse of the Lebanese political uh, politics and economy could actually cause further problems. But the big case, I think, even beyond Lebanon is Syria. Because the Iranians made a decision uh, 
very soon during the mass protest against Bashar al-Assad in 2011. And this is while the this is while the protests remained peaceful. By the way, this was before the militarization which came in. The Iranians made the decision, which is we are going to back Assad in terms of maintaining him in power. We are going to increase our liaison with his military, with his intelligence units. We are going to uh, coordinate our propaganda with Assad's propaganda machine. There are Iranian officers, officials who are in the palace in Damascus, and they have been since 2000. They were there since 2011. Uh, and that palace, by the way, is not far from where the Israelis uh, from where the Israelis attack in southern Damascus when they target Iranian commanders. The Iranians, in effect, said, OK, we're all in with Syria. The Israelis, on the other hand, have a much different perspective. Their perspective is, uh, first of all, remember, they occupy part of Syria. They occupy the Golan Heights uh, and continue to do so. The Israelis also see Iran bolstering its position in Syria as being a threat because Iran could use that as the route to channel weapons and missiles to Hezbollah in Lebanon. And again, the uprising against Assad begins less than five years after the Israel-Hezbollah war. So that's why Israel begins a policy especially as Hezbollah enters the war in 2013 on the side of the Assad regime, especially as Iran increases its military presence, the Israelis began aerial attacks against um, the movements of missiles and weapons. And the Israelis, as I say, do that for well over a decade. Um, the Syrian situation is one where the tension continues precisely because Syria, and you may know this, is no longer one country, it's three different countries. There is the part controlled by the Assad regime. There's the part in the Northwest, which is uh, under the control of the Syrian opposition backed by Turkey. And there's the, uh, uh, the part of the country in the Northeast, which is controlled by the Kurds backed by the United States. So Syria, as a zone of instability, is one where you continue to have Israeli-Iran confrontation. So that's sort of the 21st century background. There's other aspects we can bring into this. Um, but I think one of the key things that I'll mention before I, I get into Area 3 is, is now to talk directly about Israel and Palestine. Um, in 2009, the Americans launched um, an initiative under the new Obama government to, try, to finally try to get a two-state solution. That effort had stalled in 2000 at the end of the Clinton administration. And some people blame the Palestinians and Yasser Arafat. Some people blame the Israelis. It's a little bit of both, to be honest with you, as to why we couldn't get that settlement then. Uh, by 2009, the Obama administration thinks, okay, fine. We succeeded a Republican administration that was tainted by the Iraq war. We're going to make sort of a fresh start here by trying to rework what happens in the Middle East. Problem there is, is that the Israelis are now under Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is opposed to the two-state solution. Even as he was pretending to negotiate it, then he was opposed to it. And there were officials inside the Obama administration that took that supported the Israeli position, and they undercut the negotiations that were led by a man named George Mitchell a former senator who had negotiated the Good Friday Agreement in Ireland in 1998. Within a year, that effort collapses. And although there's an attempt by the Obama administration to revive it under Secretary of State Kerry a few years later, there really hasn't been a meaningful discussion for Israel-Palestinian peace, or at least a, a, a stability, which would include two states. There hasn't been an effort at that since then. And Gaza's remained un under blockade since then. Yeah. So, recent developments. Why, what happened to where we get to? Well, I mean, the, the obvious point is, is that that the uneasy, if you might want to call it equilibrium, that the Netanyahu government was maintaining with Gaza disappeared on October 7th. What is interesting is that in the two years before October 7th, because there were there were there's recurrent fighting in Gaza. It, it happens in 2008. It happens in 2014. It happens in 2016. It happens in 2021. After the 2021, 
clashes. The Netanyahu government takes a different tack, and that is our main challenge here is the possibility of a Palestinian state. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to weaken the, gov the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. And what we will do is we will actually relax our pressure on Hamas in Gaza. Now, the blockade is still maintained, but the Israelis allow more people and goods to pass across the crossing points between Israel and Gaza. The idea being that Gaza gets some economic relief. Netanyahu, enemy of my enemy is my friend, or at least enemy of my enemy is someone I can work with. At that point, his main enemy is the Palestinian Authority. Meanwhile, in the run-up to October 7th, Israeli society is completely fractured because Netanyahu wants to stay out of prison. Facing bribery allegations, he tries to put the judiciary under the thumb of the government that you would no longer have effectively an independent ju judiciary. A lot of Israeli society, which whatever you think of Palestine and Gaza, prides itself on being a democratic society, rule of law, etc., rebels against this, protest against this. And in the run-up to October 7th, you even get many people who are refusing to do military service in Israel because of this. Um, meanwhile, after the 2021 war, Hamas, its leading planners were not thinking, okay, we can live and let live with Israel because they're letting us have a little bit more economic you know, movement. They're planning for the attack. The October 7th attack was planned for two years. It was planned by Hamas leaders. It may have been broached as a possibility, as a scenario with the Iranians and with Hezbollah, with whom Hamas meets on a regular basis up in Beirut. Um, the Iranians did not know the details of the attack that was eventually launched. I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, they may not have known the timing as well. In fact, I don't think they knew the timing of it. Because what happened on October 7th is that Hamas crossed a line. It broke the rules of the game. Hamas fires rockets into Israel. The, the sirens sound. There are occasional injuries from this. Very rarely, there's a death on the Israeli side from the Hamas rockets. You live with that. That's why you have Israeli kibbutz, kibbutzim, uh, communes on the southern border. They didn't think what Hamas did on October 7th is they launched a ground invasion and they killed civilians. And they and I and that was deliberate killing of civilians to cut through the propaganda on both sides. And of course, they killed what more than 1,100 people, several hundred of whom were civilians. That's Israel's, and it's a bit crass to put it this way, but it's it's not inaccurate to say that's Israel's 9-11. You know, that's the fact that a society which has always felt to be insecure, we've always got enemies, but that its immediate security could no longer now be assured. So Israel strikes back, and it strikes back hard. And for Netanyahu, uh, he can't afford for the war to end, because the day it ends, his political future is over, and he faces going back to trial on the bribery charges. Now, that's Israel-Gaza. Why do I mention that to you? The Iranian leadership is in a defensive position after October 7th. What Hamas has done is, for a brief period of time, Hamas are the bad guys, right? They're the ones that carried out the mass killing. And Iran is being blamed as a key supporter of Hamas, providing economic and military assistance to the organization, as well as political support. So the initial responses from Iran are very, very defensive. Uh, what Hamas did, they did it on their own. We didn't do anything to do it. We support the Palestinians. We support their right to res resistance. But, you know, that, that was them. They did that. As the Israelis kill more and more Palestinians, and the large majority of them, as you know, are civilians, and the, large, the largest proportion of those civilians are women and children, 40% of the casualties in Gaza since October 7th are children. As they kill more and more Gazans, Israel becomes the bad person for many people in the international community. So then the Iranians can shift and say, yay for Hamas. Hamas is great. We, we didn't carry out October 7th, but October 7th was Operation Al-Aqsa Flood. 
Al-Aqsa, the name for you know the mosque in Jerusalem, flood, flooding across the border. Iran effectively endorses what happened on October 7th. And the rhetoric becomes more and more strident against Israel. And we got about five more minutes. Is that okay? Because there's this is going on throughout October, November, and December. And then there's a key event. There are two key events that lead to what happened in the last 10 days, one of which the media picked up on, another one of which it missed. On December 25th, Israel attacks inside Syria near Damascus. But this time they don't attack weapons and munitions. This time they carry out a targeted assassination. The missiles hit the Iranian military position in southern Damascus, not the embassy grounds. The Iranian military has got a complex that's outside the embassy ground. They kill Iran's overall commander for Syria, a man named General Mousavi. Now, those of you who might recall 2020, remember when the Americans killed General Soleimani, who was the overall commander of the Quds Force? This is the Quds Force's guy in Syria, and the Israelis have just killed him. And they don't stop there. They kill the head of intelligence and the deputy head of intelligence in another attack. They kill several other officers in yet another attack, and they kill dozens of Assad regime soldiers using missile and drone strikes. Almost at the same time, on January the 3rd, the Islamic State, for those of you who can remember those guys, because they, they haven't disappeared, they attack a ceremony in southeast Iran that is going, the march is going to the grave site of General Qasem Soleimani, the general who was assassinated in 2020. They kill 94 people. Iran never catches the people who did that. That was a double bombing. So now the Iranians are looking really, really vulnerable. So what do they do? They don't attack Israel directly, not at this point. What they do is, is that Iranian-led militia in Syria and Iraq step up their attacks on American personnel. And between early, between October 7th and early February, there were more than 150 attacks on bases with U.S. personnel in Iraq and in Syria, causing limited casualties. But they're still annoying because you got rockets flying at you, you know, almost every night. And the Iranians decide they're going to fire missiles into Pakistan, supposedly going after the Baluch insurgency group called Jaish al -Adil. But what happens? The Americans retaliate with airstrikes on the militia, the Iranian-led militia, to the point where the head of the Quds Force has to tell the militia at the end of January, you need to stop now. And there were no attacks on American personnel on bases in Iraq and Syria between early February until two days ago, when there was a limited attack. Meanwhile, what the Iranians, I think, did not expect is Pakistan fired back. They fired missiles into southeast Iran and embarrassed the Iranians. So now the Iranian leadership has looked weak. On April the 1st, the Israelis attacked again with another targeted assassination. What happened is they got from their intelligence that Iran's top commander for both Syria and Lebanon, General, Sah uh, General Sahedi, was traveling from Tehran to a meeting in Damascus. That meeting was in the consular building next to the embassy. They killed Zahedi. They killed the chief of staff for the Iranian military. They killed his chief of staff, I should say. And they killed five other officers. And they had done it on Iranian sovereign territory because a diplomatic mission is sovereign territory of the state whose embassy or consulate that it is. And that's where they crossed the line with the Iranians because now the Iranians look impotent or the Iranian leadership looks impotent if it didn't respond. It was just a question of when and how they were going to retaliate. But when they retaliate, 
to drive the point home. The Iranians told neighboring countries they were going to attack. But the Iranians also told Turkey and Switzerland because Turkey and Switzerland were the channels to inform the United States. And of course, if the US knew the attack was coming, then Israel would know the attack was coming. That's why not a single cruise missile or drone made it to Israeli territory. And only a few ballistic missiles made it through to a sparsely populated area. And the key here is sparsely populated in the Negev Desert, where they did uh, up to nine ballistic missiles hit two Israeli bases, air bases in the region, caused minor damage, and there was only one serious casualty, not to mention, which was a Bedouin girl, because they're a Bedouin who moved through the desert uh, and she required surgery. It was a demonstration attack. Iran could thump its chest to its population. We have responded. And it could demonstrate to the Israelis, if you if you hit us again, the next attack might be more serious. And then Israel does its own demonstration attack. It uses only drones and, as far as we know, fired two missiles. One missile hit an anti-aircraft, an anti-air defense system guarding one of the Iranian military bases. The Israelis say that the second missile, they self-detonated that once they knew the first missile had landed to limit the damage. There are others who say that the second missile malfunctioned. Anyway, it's a limited attack. It is not on Iran's nuclear facilities, and it's on military bases that were attacked by Israel in 2021 and 2023, because they make missiles and drones in those bases. A limited, symbolic demonstration attack, which is where we are today. Because the easy thing for me to say as an analyst is, everybody now can take a step back from direct confrontation. They made their point, right? But what does that do to the indirect war? Does Hezbollah step up its activities in Lebanon? Do the Iranian-led militias fire on US personnel again? And as I mentioned the night before last, they fired five rockets on an American air base in Eastern Syria just sort of as a token attack. But that was in part, by the way, because someone attacked an Iraqi base with those militia on it and killed one militia man and, eight, and wounded eight in Western Iraq uh, earlier that day. So a little bit of tit for tat there. Big open-ended question is whether the Israelis continue with targeted assassinations. That's the open-ended thing for me right now. And I'll leave it at that. I can talk about other aspects, but I want to find out what you're interested in and we'll take it from there.